Hello everybody, it's Anna and welcome back to my booktube channel. This video, one of these days, I'm going to actually remember that I need to look up the dates for the Geekly wrap up. Be right back. Okay. <laughs> This week's Geekly Wrap-Up is going to be all of the books that I read and games that I played from September 2nd to September 8th. Um, this is coming off of the weekend that I went to PAX West, so I didn't end up getting a whole ton of reading done, but I did game a lot, as you will see. So the first two books that I read were for Space Opera September. I finished reading On a Sunbeam by Tilly Walden, which is a giant 500-page graphic novel about a family of misfits that work on a spaceship that's basically like a giant koi fish, and they go sailing around all of space to find these old historical sites. They're almost like space archaeologists, I think, is the best way to describe it. And it's about Mia, the main character, who um, a long time ago had to say goodbye rather unexpectedly to her girlfriend from high school and she's trying to find her girlfriend again to make things right. There was nothing like that was objectively wrong with this book, I just didn't really gel with it for some reason. I think that reading Tilly Walden's books, while it is pretty good for, you know, queer representation and that kind of thing, just leaves me in a really depressed frame of mind when I finish reading her books because they are pretty fucking sad. Like, a lot of people in the books are pretty miserable. Um, they don't really get to a place of being less depressed throughout the story. So even though like the story was good and the representation was interesting, I just didn't really get along very well with it. But I gave it three out of five stars. And then I finished my novella challenge for Space Opera September, which was reading The Tea Master and the Detective by Aliette de Bodard, which I finished last night. That was really, really good. It definitely gave me shades of the Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson relationship between the two main characters. And I don't wanna to say too much about it because it is kind of a murder mystery, so I don't wanna give away the plot, but I will say that it does feature one of my very favorite things in science fiction, which is the sentient spaceship. There is a character that is called a mind ship and they are a just sentient, mind that goes inside of a ship that travels throughout deep space and it's a story that deals with like how an AI like that would process things like grief and trauma and I really just adored it. It really checked all of my boxes. The only thing that I wish would be different is that it would be longer, but I know that Aliette de Bodard has actually written a bunch of other novellas that are set in the same universe, so I am most likely gonna get those for my Kindle. And yeah, I don't have anything to hold up for uh, Tea Master and the Detective because it's on my Kindle, which is currently charging because it almost died last night while I was trying to finish the novella. And then I read two other books that were just sort of like things that I, you know, had, had started at the beginning of the week before September. One of those was Waiting for Tom Hanks by Carrie Winfrey. This is an adult romance novel about a girl that wants to be a film writer and she is obsessed with the Nora Ephron romantic comedies from the 90s, specifically the ones that are starring Tom Hanks. This overall was just a very generic example of like the adult romance genre. I was intrigued by the title, but ultimately the characters came across as very two-dimensional and not noticeably different from just a very standard uh, tropey romance character. I also thought that the author's kind of weird digs at the protagonist's uncle, who is sort of a very, you know, shy, quiet, nerdy, older man that, you know, is playing D&D &D and going to conventions and stuff like that. It felt like that character was unnecessarily put down a lot um, for kind of being this I don't know, he was very infantilized by the protagonist because of his interests, and I was like, the author knows enough about D&D &D to know, like, that there's a stereotype, but she clearly knows more than just the stereotype, so why would she just be leaning back on that to create this character who otherwise is just a very nice and amazing supportive uncle and really loves his niece? I don't really know. So, the book was just fine. I gave it three out of five stars. Uh... Yeah, read it if it sounds interesting, but it's not gonna, you know, blow anyone's mind, I don't think. And then I finished reading a graphic novel, which is very short, called Wait, What? 
a comic book guide to relationships, bodies, and growing up. It is by Heather Karina and Isabella Rotman and colored by Luke B. Howard. I picked this up on a whim from my comic book shop when I went to go pick up my single issues this week because it's put out by the same people that did the quick and easy guide to they them pronouns and the quick and easy guide to queer and trans identities which have been some of my favorite queer comic books this year and then I think late last year is when they them came out and this is a sort of like sex and sexuality education comic that's aimed at I guess like maybe preteens, younger teens kind of thing, I'd say maybe somebody that is about to start puberty or has already started puberty. Um, and it is just delightful and wonderful. I really wish that more stuff like this had existed when I was growing up, but I'm really glad that it exists now. And I'm really glad that queer comics are having such a moment right now. Um, not just on booktube where I see a lot of fantastic queer fiction comics get recommended all the time, but in the like comic book shops and places that I go to, I am a little biased since I do go to a comic book shop that has uh, explicit like focus on queer and trans comics and comic creators. But I think that like they're starting to enter the mainstream more and I think that that's awesome because it can only help other people be more happy and that just makes me happy. So yeah, I thought that this book was great in terms of the types of race, gender, and sexuality diversity that was included in it. It is definitely a lot more about coming to terms with being comfortable with your own body, not putting a lot of pressure on yourself to, you know, figure out your sexuality or figure out whether you want to start dating people when you're like 12 or something like that. I thought that overall it was just a very, like, positive healthy look at human sexuality and I would definitely recommend this for if you have you know young people in your life that could use it or if you're just interested like I am in the sort of like sex and sex education books side of things. Okay so those are all of the books that I read. I also played three board games. Uh, two of these I had already played before and one of them was new. One of the ones I had already played before is called Architects of the West Kingdom. It's a Euro game, which is something that, uh, well, how do I explain what a Euro game is? I really should have thought how to explain a Euro game before I hit record. Um, so a Euro game is basically the type of board game where the like player competition doesn't happen through direct confrontation. It happens very indirectly. Oftentimes, Euro games involve a lot of what's called resource management or worker placement, which is you have little like worker meeples that you'll put on the board. They'll go do a task and collect some resources for you, and you're trying to use those resources to get towards a specific goal. In this case, it's to build a lot of buildings because we are being architects of the West Kingdom. So it has a very like heavy medieval theme and you're able to do all sorts of different actions that allow you to either build buildings for your city or work on building the cathedral. I am very happy to say that I won this game and I beat my husband and I did it by taking a very sort of evil and not virtuous strategy. There's a virtue track in this game which I think adds an interesting element to it. So depending on how virtuous you are, you're not able to do things like go to the black market and get goods for really cheap. Whereas if you're like very uh, vicious, I guess, would be the opposite of virtue, you're not allowed to work on the cathedral, but you get to do cool things like evade your taxes, which is the tack that I took. Didn't think it was gonna work, and I ended up pulling out an amazing victory. This is one of my favorite board games that I played this year. I'm really happy that I have my own copy of it right now, and I can't wait to play it again. Okay, next is a game that I have also already played several times, and I think it's the board game in the collection that we've played the most this year, and it's called Quacks of Quidlinburg. This is a push your luck style game where the premises were a bunch of like quack doctors at a medieval fair, and we're trying to throw as many different types of ingredients into our, you know, quack potions that we're peddling without having the potions explode. So the way that this works is every player has a little board that's like a cauldron, and we add these different color chips to the board to like symbolize the ingredients that we're adding to our potion. Everybody has a certain number of white chips, which are your explosive ingredients. And if your number is printed on the white chips, 
ever add up to more than the value of seven, your potion explodes and you're not allowed to keep adding ingredients to it. So it's kind of a push your luck game where you're trying to add as many ingredients to your potion to make it as valuable as possible without exploding. Um, the thing that does make this game interesting with a bit of a twist is that you are never allowed to look back into your potion ingredients bag after you've already put ingredients in the bag. So it does become kind of a memory game in that sense. Uh, like how good are you at probability, but also remembering what different types and how many of each color ingredients you have. So you can sort of feel around in the bag if you wanna know how many different color chips you have left, but you're never actually able to look back in the bag and see what you have there. I think I managed to win this game as well through like a really crazy kind of last minute effort, but it's really just a game that definitely is, the joy is found in the playing and not in the winning of this game. Whether you win or lose, you'll have a wonderful time playing this game. Uh, if you are of age, uh, it's also a really excellent drinking game because trying to see how, you know, how well you're able to remember what chips are in your bag becomes totally further complicated when you've had a couple of drinks in you. So <laughs> yeah, if you're of age, that can also be fun too. And then I have uh, the last game that I played, which is a new game to me, and it is called Tiny Towns. I played this one time with my husband this week. Um, this is a new roll and write game. I've talked about roll and writes before in previous Geekly wrap-ups, but basically you do something to the equivalent of rolling dice and everyone has to put something on the everyone has to put the die result on their player board in some way. In this case, you're not rolling dice, you're trying, you're drawing cards, but you're drawing cards that give you different building materials that you need to build buildings for your tiny towns. So the way that the game actually plays is sort of similar to a Tetris type thing, where in order to uh, build different buildings, you have to have different configurations, like little Tetris blocks of different types of resources. So you're trying to like build buildings that will give you points at the end of the game, while also leaving yourself enough room on your player board to actually fit all of these weird Tetris-y shapes um, on the board and not basically block yourself into a corner like I did and have your village's water well be entirely barricaded behind a bunch of warehouses. So yeah, my villagers were very thirsty, but they had so much in terms of warehouses. They had the most beautiful church. They had an archive of the second age with a little scholarly mouse on the card. So, you know, it, I think it was worth it, right? <laughs> So that is going to do it for all of the books that I read and games that I played this week. I am currently making my way through Dune and also reading, watching, and looking at all the beautiful pictures of you folks that went to BookNet Fest. I have some serious FOMO that I wasn't able to make it this year, but I am really, really, really going to try my best to make it next year. So if you enjoyed this video, please do leave a comment down below. Let's get a fun conversation about the books started there. And subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already, because as you know, I am on a quest to get 300 subscribers by the end of the year. So I would very much appreciate it if you would add yourselves to our legions of, you know, board game geeky stuff fans. <laughs> all right. Thank you all, as always, very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.